chapter 39, please. Genesis and chapter 39. This is our fourth study on the little series in the life of Joseph. And I want to speak this morning, the title of the little message is The Beginnings of Testings. The Beginnings of Testings. And here we read the story, Joseph is now down in Egypt and sold by his brothers and bought into the house of of Potiphar. So we're going to read from chapter 39, verse 1 to, verses, to verse 6. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, uh, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Amen. May God bless his word to all our hearts. I just want to pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this wonderful book, the Bible, God's revealed truth. And we ask, Lord, as we look into your word just now, that God the Holy Spirit will come to all our hearts. And Father, bless us and teach us these wonderful truths and lessons and help us, Lord, to live lives to the glory of your name. So grant, Lord, that help and that anointing of the Holy Spirit in the perfect law of liberty, I pray, and I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. The beginnings of testings. Uh, God doesn't put us into universities. God's school is the school of life. And uh, we as believers, as Christians, as God's children, we are in God's schoolhouse every day and we're learning continually. It's through the lessons of life that we mature and grow and they develop as believers. And as we said, as we look into the life of Joseph, we can identify so much with him in our daily experience, on our pilgrimage as we are going from earth to heaven and how the Lord leads us and guides us and overrules in our circumstances and how he guides us through. We spoke the last time, how did Joseph cope? We looked about what his brothers did to him, stripped him of his coat, put him into the pit, sold him, left him wailing and crying for mercy, and yet they showed him none. And sitting down, they ate as the young man of 17 cried out of that pit that his brothers would mercy upon him and they sold him. And I'm sure as he looked back on his brothers as he traveled down that highway, that uh, trade route down into Egypt, he wondered what, what lay ahead of him. You know, isn't it a bit like that as a Christian? We don't know what lies ahead. Uh, but there's only one thing Joseph could do and what Joseph had to learn very quickly and that you and I have to learn as well, many lessons Joseph's total dependence was upon God. Joseph's total dependence was upon his God. And here he was heading on this journey, rejected by men, sold by men, but he was kept by God. Rejected by men, but accepted by God. And look at the contrast for the believer in the life of Joseph. Romans 8, 31 to 39 are tremendous verses. The promises of the Lord Jesus to his children. Who shall separate us 
from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wonderful verses and reassurance, totally profound. And it says here in verse 2, how did he cope? The Lord was with Joseph. That's the key. That was the secret. We brought that out last week. The Lord was with Joseph. You know, one with God is a majority. It seems so bizarre, but it's true. If God be for us, Paul said, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. If God be for us, which he is, who then can be against us? And remember the verses that we've been sharing and thinking about, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. Try and tell that to Joseph when he's in fetters on the camel's back heading down to Egypt. He said, <laughs> it didn't just seem to fit in there and then. The steps of a, of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord and he delayed it in his ways. Tell Joseph that when he's in the camel's back heading into Egypt. Doesn't make sense. But God has a plan and God has a purpose. And it's the same in your life. There'll be situations you're in where it just doesn't make sense. But God is at work. And so it's a, it's an, it's a tremendous study and encouragement. You know, there are times when, when we're just not sure about things. But I've, met, I've written a wee note here. His presence most of the time is not a conscious feeling. It's not true. God's presence most of the time is not a conscious feeling, but a constant help and strength in time of need is there. He gives us his constant strength and help in time of need. He has promised that. I read something that I felt was so, so fitting and so profound. It was written on a cellar wall in Cologne, Germany during the Holocaust. And uh, the words on the cellar wall was, I believe in the sun, even, even when it is not shining. I believe in love, even when I cannot feel it. And it said, I believe in God, even when he is silent. I believe, is not tremendous. And some dear Jewish Holocaust victim had written that. I believe in God, <laughs> even when he's silent. And did Joseph hear anything from God going down that road? Well, I can't say because there's nothing recorded in his word. But it did say that the Lord was with him. I just want to say, dear child of God, this morning, take encouragement. No matter how you feel, he's with you. Didn't he say that I will never leave you? I'll never forsake you. And God keeps his word. You know, it's better to be sitting with the Lord in the darkness than to be walking in the light without him. That's a big statement, but it's a true statement. It's better to have the Lord with you in the darkness than walking in the light without him. So, I want you to notice here a number of things about Joseph. First of all, he recognized very early on his total dependence upon God. And that's the lesson we have to learn as well as, as young Christians. Yes, it's nice to have a pastor. It's great to be able to come to God's house and hear God's word. It's great to have encouraging friends. But God will bring you to a place at some stage in your life where you realize it's him you really need. And it's only him that you can truly depend upon for your journey. That's a, that's a lesson that we all have to learn as Christians. And as the old saints used to say, keep your eyes on Jesus and don't look to man and please don't look to me because uh, I'm just a man and we, we, I'll fail you. We, you know, we all fail. Uh, 
we make mistakes, uh, we say things we shouldn't say, we do things we shouldn't do, we all fail, uh, but God gives us grace and uh, picks us up and dusts us down and we go on. So we don't set our standards by any mortal man, but by the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. We look to him and keep our eyes fixed on him. So Joseph realized his total dependence was upon his God. And we see here, there's a lovely truth that the Lord revealed to me in this passage as well. Johnny, there's a wee bit of a tin coming through this sound system. Yeah, you might have took it a wee bit. Joseph didn't fight God, and he didn't fight his trials. Joseph didn't fight God here, and he didn't fight his trials. In other words, what I'm saying is this, he accepted his situation. He accepted his situation. He could do nothing only place himself in God's hands and let God work it out. You know, isn't there times we want to fix it? Times we want to sort it. Times we, we, we think we can, we can sort this problem out but we can't we can't fix it we have to commit it to the Lord's hands because we're depending on him and Joseph didn't fight God or God's will he just had to surrender and accept the journey he was on he couldn't do anything you know, maybe you're here this morning and you're facing a very difficult situation, perhaps with your family, with your finances, or with a sickness, with an illness, and you're trying to fix it and you're trying to fight it. You can't fix it. And fighting it will only wear you out. You've got to accept it and let God sort it because he knows what he's doing. And this is the lovely thing about this study of Joseph. Can't you see yourself in it? Isn't it a mirror of your Christian experience of your walk with Christ? It's a mirror image of your life as a believer till you get to heaven. So Joseph accepted where he was and what was happening. So what does it mean then? It says, on the Lord was with him. That's a profound verse. Verse 2 of, of chapter 39. And the Lord was with Joseph. That's everything, isn't it? To know that you're saved, to know that the Lord is with you, should bring the comfort and the encouragement to your soul. Knowing that he's with you, that you have the Lord. You see, <clears throat> When we are, as Christians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. You're living a new life. And that new life as a Christian is going to bring you new experiences and new adventures. And it's going to bring you into a walk with God that is totally so far removed from your previous walk and your previous lifestyle uh, when you've committed that on to God. And it's a great life to be saved. And uh, everything flows from Christ as a Christian. As love flows, the joy flows, the peace flows, the forgiveness flows, the fellowship flows, the grace flows. And Joseph had the promises of God. Remember, I brought that before you. The dreams were God's promises because he didn't have a Bible. And he held on to what God gave him. This is why in the darkness we need to hold on to the word of God. We need to hold on to the promises. Because even though we change and the weather change and circumstances change and whatever comes our way, he changes not. And you can depend upon God and you can depend upon his word. We change as we get older our priorities change, our thinking changes, but he changes not. And Joseph was holding on to what God had given to him. And that's just tremendous. All right then, it says here, 
Uh, and the Lord was with Joseph. We know that. But here's another amazing thing. And he was a prosperous man. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a prosperous man. Well, in what way was he prosperous? Well, it certainly was not material. The Lord Jesus said on one occasion in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And we, we sometimes think it's what we possess is a sign of prosperity. We, we regard prosperity as regards material possessions. What, what we have is a measure of our prosperity. And this is why, you know, in the, that program, The Billionaire's Lifestyle, it's, it's the more that it costs was a, a status sign of prosperity and wealth. But the Bible doesn't class it like that. It says Joseph was a prosperous man. And when I thought about this, he came down into Egypt as a slave. He had no luggage. He had no suitcase. The only thing he had was the clothes that were upon his back and maybe the sandals on his feet. So he had, no, he had no luggage. And he didn't even have the language. He had no language. Can you imagine going to live in a foreign country and you can't even speak the language? And yet the word of God says he, he's a prosperous man. It just seems so far, far removed. He... In one sense, he was in an, ex, an extreme poverty in his regards to material possessions. But the word of God says he's a prosperous man. So, so what is it that was, was making Joseph prosperous? Yet the Bible says he was a prosperous man. How is that possible? Well, he's prosperous because God's with him. That's the key. And God was with Joseph. And because of that, Joseph was a prosperous man. Not materially at this stage, but spiritually. Joseph had spiritual wealth and vitality. You know, that's worth more than this world's goods. And all his riches and wealth he had the Lord's blessing. He had God's favor. And as a result, the Lord says, he's a prosperous man. So what did he have then to make him a prosperous man? Well, he had the fear of God. We read that. That's his own testimony. He states that himself in Genesis 42, 18. He said to his brothers, I fear God. The Bible says in Proverbs, that's the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. What's wrong with our society today? It doesn't fear God. Each and every one of you got saved for the number one reason was this. You fear God. You feared hell or you'd have never come to Christ. You fear his wrath. God is a God of mercy. He's speaking to the world today. But many don't see it, don't hear his voice. And God is to be feared. But many know. But Joseph feared God. And the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So this is how he was a prosperous man. And he had the promises of God. He had the promises of God. This is why he's prosperous. God had given him those dreams. And as we go through the study of his life, we'll see they were fulfilled. 
What does that teach me this morning? What does that teach you? God keeps his word. God keeps his promise. Has he promised to save you and keep you? He has. Has he promised if you walk in obedience to him to take you to heaven? He will. Do you want to go this morning? No, you're not. But he will get you there when the time's right. Just like Joseph will be fulfilled in his time. So he had the promises of God. He had the wisdom of God. He was able, God gave him wisdom to interpret dreams. And if you read the second chapter of the book of Proverbs, you can make that your prayer. I did that years ago for to ask God for his wisdom. He says wisdom is far above rubies. Wisdom is the greatest possession that you can possess as a Christian. Spiritual wisdom, the wisdom of God, and he'll give it to you if you seek it. He said that in James, any man, any woman lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to you all liberally and, and upbraideth not. He, he gives it if you'll seek it. And it's in his word. There's some things you don't have to ask God for, for they're already instructed in his truth. And wisdom is of great value and wealth, spiritual wisdom. There's knowledge and there's wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to use knowledge correctly. That's what wisdom is. Many people have knowledge, but to have knowledge on wisdom is a tremendous blessing. Joseph had wisdom. It comes out here. And remember, we spoke about God is preparing a man for the second highest position in the greatest kingdom in the world. Boys, God's methods and God's ways. You know, if you were schooling somebody, to put them into a place of great authority, is this the way you would do it? Is this what you, is this, would this be the plan that you would choose for your son? Think of the similarities between Joseph and the Lord Jesus, born in obscurity, born in poverty, born into a little Jewish home in Nazareth, reared, reared up in a place where they're struggling for finances to meet their needs. This is God's way. He wasn't born into a palace. He was born in an open courtyard in Bethlehem. But God knows what he's doing. Same as he knows what he's doing in Joseph's life. So we give him wisdom. And he had perfect trust and, and, and confidence in God. You see, the Old Testament word for faith, the New Testament word is faith. Belief in the Lord, believe in God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The Old Testament word for faith is trust. Trust, it's the same thing. And Joseph trusted God. His, his trust was in his God. Every day he trusted him. That's a continual lifestyle. That's, that's a continual walk. I don't know what's happening, but I'm trusting that's faith. And we have a greater revelation than Joseph because we have got the whole of the Bible. Joseph didn't even have a Bible. But he's a very spiritual young man, 17 years of age. So he had perfect trust and confidence in God and he had an impeccable testimony to the glory of God. As we see here, an impeccable testimony to the glory of God because the ungodly seen God in him. The ungodly Egyptian Potiphar seen God in this man. Isn't that an amazing testimony? He's seen as God in him. It says in verse 3, this is Potiphar, Joseph's master, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. What a testimony. What a testimony Joseph had in this house. He didn't fight God's will. He accepted his situation. And he lived in the house to the glory of God. A come on believer this morning. Our God is an awesome. He can bless you where you are. He can bless you in the school. Accept the situation. He can bless you in the business. He can bless you in the workplace. He can bless you in the university. He wants to use you where you are. 
He wants to use you where you are. And Joseph didn't complain. Can you imagine Joseph every morning complaining? You know, I had a coat of many colors. I'm going to inherit the promises. You know, my, my family's, none of that. He just lived the life. You know, the greatest testimonies are those, not who talk about it, but who just live it. They just live the life. They're just shining for the Lord where God has placed them. And that's all he asks, that you'll shine where he's placed you. He had, he had an impeccable testimony to the glory of God. And what did the ungodly Egyptian see in Joseph's life? Well, he's seen his trust in his God, Jehovah, daily. He's seen him in his walk. He's seen him in his daily life. And this ungodly man recognized the fruit of his testimony. The fruit of Joseph's testimony because this ungodly man recognized his God is with him. And all that he does is prospering in his hand. That's the secret of success. God's in it. And if God's in it, he'll bless it. And he'll prosper it in his hand. You see, it wasn't what was in Joseph's hand. Joseph was in the hand of God. Do you see the reversal? And because Joseph's in the hand of God, whatever's in Joseph's hand will be blessed. That's the key to the fruitful Christian life. Are you, are you all in his hands this morning? Hope you haven't a leg out or an arm out. Hope you're all in. And if you're all in, he'll prosper it all in your hand. I experience something of that in my lifetime in business as a Christian. God will bless when it's all over for him. There was prosperity in his testimony. And though not only as a result, he realized this Egyptian, because of Joseph's prosperity, he was being prospered. He was being prospered. The Egyptian saw the fruit of his testimony and uh, there was prosperity for the Egyptian and for his house. And he realized that because God was blessing Joseph, he was being blessed as well. You know, what an influence we can have in our workplace. Maybe you're the only Christian in where you work and God can bless that business because of you. Remember on one occasion this old godly man, such a man of prayer, and he was working in this business for started off four days. This is after he retired and at 65 from his official workplace and he got this little job. He was there four days a week. He was there three days a week. He was there two days a week as his age progressed. And that business was abounding. And it came to the stage then where the man just wasn't fit to work anymore. It wasn't that he needed the money. When he, when he got the money, the money that he brought home, he gave so much to that missionary. And he gave so much to that missionary. And he gave so much to that work. It wasn't for himself. He just loved the Lord and loved to give to God's work. But he died. And uh, the man of the business said to me, we were in conversation he says, one of my biggest fears now is that I don't have that man's prayers anymore. I don't have his prayers for the, and he prayed for the business. And he prayed for them. He says, I don't have his prayers anymore. And you know the amazing thing? I don't know whether it's how it come about anyway, but a number of years later, that, that man's business bankrupt. He doesn't have a business anymore. And that man prayed for that business. You know, if you're in business and uh, are working for a businessman and you're praying for them, they don't even realize the value of your prayers. Your employer may not realize the value of your input. 
And because God is blessing you, they can be blessed and they don't even know it. But this man recognized it and he knew it. And as a result, he gave, he gave Joseph a place of position. It says in verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, this is his master Potiphar, and he served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. The Egyptian entrusted Joseph with all that he had. That is some testimony to have. But this man entrusted everything that he possessed to the hands of Joseph. Could my employer entrust me with his goods and with his wealth? How would I handle it? Could they entrust you with such responsibility? How would we handle it? But Joseph was living in such a place with his God, walking such a, a disciplined life, and in fellowship with his God, of course, Jehovah, we know the Lord Jesus, that this man seen it that he could be trusted. He entrusted him, it says, with all his substance. He, he gave everything to Joseph that he had. I have 10 minutes. Deuteronomy 28 5 says, Blessed shall be thy basket and thy storehouse. And we see here that Joseph, the Lord, he says, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse you that curse you. And here, Joseph. He, this man, Potiphar, this unsaved man, he was blessed in the house and he was blessed in the field. God's blessing was upon this ungodly Egyptian because of Joseph. And we see here that it says in verse 5, and it came to pass from that time, what time? The time that the Egyptian entrusted it to Joseph. He made him overseer in his house. He blessed him in the house. And over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for, this, for Joseph's sake. The Lord blessed him. That's a, would you not want an, an employee like that if you had run the business? Would you not want an, a, a Christian worker in your company or in your school or somewhere that had a testimony like that? that the class, the boys and girls are blessed because of your walk. What, a, what an encouragement this morning. The influence that this godly man had in his surroundings where God had placed him. He could have went in there and complained from day to day. You know, you don't get any work complaining. You not do any good. Moaning and groaning and complaining. Look what happened to the children of Israel. They moaned and they complained. And God gave them cornflakes, manna for 40 years. And they ate the same old food because they complained. And then they were looking meat. And he sent them quails and he stuffed them full of meat and they complained. Took them to the, the waters of Mara and they drunk the water and it was better and they complained again. You don't get anywhere with God moaning. You don't get anywhere with God complaining. And you're not getting anywhere with me either because I don't like it. Complaining does no good. Ask my wife. You'll not get anywhere moaning or complaining. Be appreciative. Be thankful. Think about what you have and what you haven't have and give God the glory and quit whinging and groaning and complaining because you're weary in God's ears. Be thankful for what you have. I'm not a grumbler, a whinger, a moaner, and a complainer. Let's stand up. Joseph blessed his house, Potiphar's house, because of his life. Proverbs 10, 22 says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and addeth no sorrow with it. It brings blessing. So he was blessed in the house and he was blessed in the field. 
Potiphar, he had full crops, he had full barns, he had healthy animals, he had full yield. In the home there was no sickness, he was happy, he was contented, all was going well in his situation. And the amazing thing is this, God is watching. The Lord is watching. You know, friends, he's watching us. God is watching you. The Lord Jesus is watching. Every day his eyes are upon us. He's the silent guest in every home. He hears our conversations. He's watching our walk. We can hide nothing from him. If we're sinning, he sees it. If we're disobedient, he knows it. He's watching. God is forever watching you. Never think for a moment that you're walking in secret. No, all is naked and open before God. You're an open book. Your life's open. He sees all that's going on. Just think for a moment when you're going to do something and you're questioning it. Jesus is standing beside you. Will he be happy uh, with what you're about to do? The favor of God was upon Potiphar's house and upon his family. And you know, Potiphar knew through Joseph's life that his God, Jehovah, was the one true God. And as we go into this story, it's amazing, even, even the Exodus, how God revealed that he is the one true God. Here's one young lad that God has taken in to Egypt. And uh, it says in the later chapters, he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He can turn it around. And uh, Joseph's testimony, it says here in verse 6, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored, and God doesn't tell lies. He was a good young man and well favored. He was likable. He was a likable person. He's the sort of young man you'd want to be around and well favored. Now very quickly, what's the application then? What, how relevant is this to me? There needs to be an application to the teaching. In other words, how do I apply this to my life? What does it mean to me on the uh, 8th of March 2020, with all this corona and everything that's going on, how does this impact my life today, very quickly? What's the application? Number one, don't fight God, but submit to his will. Don't fight God, but submit to his will. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you will find that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. Don't fight God. He has a plan for your life. All right? Trust in the Lord at all times. It's easy to trust him when all's going well. But when it's not going so well, maybe it's not so easy to trust. Psalm 62 and 8, God spoke this scripture to Mandy and I when we were about to bury our little girl. And he said, Psalm 62 and 8, Trust in the Lord at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. Tell him about it, for God is a refuge for us. Tell him about your situation. Tell him about your need. But trust him, that's faith. Remember, faith in the Old Testament is the trust is the word faith. Trust in Him at all times. Whatever your situation is, trust Him. Confidence. Have confidence here. Joseph had confidence in God, otherwise, he couldn't cope. His confidence was in His God, was in His dreams, was in His promises. He knew God had a plan. Romans 8 28. Whatever your situation this morning, whatever your station, All things work together for good to them that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. And just in passing, the lights are still on here. 
you still have a minister, we still have a congregation, God has still something to do. That's just one little example. So whatever God's doing, he's working it out. He's working it out in your family, he's working it out in the children, he's working it out in your situation. Don't try to help God. Joseph could do nothing. Don't try to help him, just pray and trust him. And he will work it out in his time. But it's hard trusting and it's hard waiting. And we're just, uh, at times we interfere in God's great plan. Learn to wait on God and you'll find it's the greatest thing you can do. Wait on him and trust him. Very quickly, assurance. Joseph had assurance through this passage. Our assurance is in the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 13 and 8. He says, I, <coughs> I will never, 13 and 5, he says, <coughs> I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He'll not abandon you. So we have assurance in his word and in his promises. And Joseph was an obedient man. This is the key to the fruitful Christian life is obedience when God speaks. How many times has God spoken to you from this pulpit and you've disobeyed that word? He has asked you to do something and you still as yet haven't done it. Whatever it is, you haven't obeyed. You're robbing yourself of God's blessing in your life. You don't realize it, but you are robbing yourself. God has asked you to obey because obedience releases blessing. And God wants to bless. So obey. Job 23 and 10, 10 says, But I know he knoweth the way that I take, and when he has tried me, there's testings for the Christian. He'll test your obedience. He'll test your consecration. He'll test your faith. He'll test your walk. He does that. He's God. And, and great faith comes through great testings and great trials. And he says, Job says, but I, he knows the way that I take. But when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold purified in the fire seven times, coming forth as gold when he takes the dross out and leaves this pure gold where he can see his reflection in the gold. He knows it's clean and it's clear and it's perfect and he can make with the dam whatever he wants. And Job said that. He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And here's my final little words here. In our trials and tribulations, Christ reveals to us his all-sufficient strength and grace and to bring to our awareness our total dependence upon him, that we are held completely by his hand and reliant on his care alone. We must not step out alone. There's no way to learn great faith except through trials. They are God's school of faith. And once we have learned that lesson, it is the everlasting possession and provision for our walk. Amen. May God bless his word to all our hearts.